On this week's episode of the A2B podcast, I'm joined by the highly talented and credited filmmaker Brendan Canty. A Cork boy himself, Canty has over 10 years experience in the industry and is very well known for the direction of Hosier's Take Me to Church music video. Canty has been nominated for various awards, including two MTV Video Music Awards. In 2019, Canty signed for one of the world's top production companies, Smuggler, who have worked with some of the world's biggest brands and artists. Hi Brendan, how's it going? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, man. Um, this is possibly the earliest I've recorded a podcast. Um, <laughs> it's twenty past so eleven. So, uh, yeah, man. We, we we like to do things a bit later in the evening here now, but uh, <laughs> no, I have a few coffees into me. Um, so <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, people don't find me too groggy. Um, <laughs> but uh, how how are you keeping yourself, man? I've been keeping uh, very busy, and the very busy period ended about two weeks ago so i've been having some downtime which has been nice that's great man um and and what what were you kind of most recently up to in terms of projects so what was keeping you busy i was working on a campaign for fall to ireland um wow yeah i, I made i made three commercials at the end of last year and uh, i was lucky uh actually i don't really like saying lucky but i mean i guess i am during the pandemic fall to got a i mean they were just encouraged to promote tourism for whenever this pandemic ends to boost the tourism economy so they were in, they wanted to make a bunch more ads and i made the ones last year so um so yeah so i ended up making like individual county films um for for fall to ireland so that was the biggest shoot of my life it was like a 28 day commercial shoot from Donegal all down the west coast and then up the east coast making making 12 12 ads for Ireland <laughs> um, that's crazy yeah it was it was it took a while and then the post uh, after that the editing the grading all of that sort of stuff um <clears throat> and 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 do you edit and, and do all the grading yourself from there no but i uh well, I have I I would with smaller projects, but with projects like this, you'd have you'd have editors and you'd have color graders and you'd have people doing the sound and the music and whatever. And um, but it it would be my job as the director to I guess make sure the direction is on track. So overseeing that's, all of these things. That's great, and and I suppose because you know you've worked in small projects yourself before and you've had kind of full creative vision. Um, what's it like when you work with someone as big as like, I suppose you know uh, relatively in terms of what you've done would fall to Ireland when you find out that oh no like you know John's going to do the music you've no input with the music and oh no like Paddy's going to be doing the colour grade now man you, you leave that alone do you ever feel as a kind of a, a creator that like you know that's limiting your creativity or are you only happy to like delegate those tasks Um, it's making commercials is a completely different beast to making a music video for like your mate's band it's like and you just have to accept that and you hear stories about directors normally early on in the career as a commercial director because you won't go too far if you're going to be getting frustrated by all the things you just said you have to learn how to delegate and like for the most part people aren't like dickheads you know people are people have hired you to direct the project so as long as you are doing that right and hitting their needs and but also bring in an added flair to it and a magic to it, then they are happy for you to suggest those external teams like but mm -hmm. along the way, for example, I wanted a color grader and he was in New York and very expensive. So that becomes a bit of a back and forth negotiation thing of me having to convince the people with the money why we need them and but everybody in this project especially was just super lovely and accommodating and encouraging and really got behind my vision for the project um and pretty much gave me everything i needed to achieve that and and it just be and and that attitude um really encourages good collaboration as well so um so yeah it was just a great team effort like um but you do get commercials where uh, 
big creative decisions are taken away from you and mm. but like one of some of the biggest the biggest part of being a commercials director is being able to manage the client manage expectations and to come out with something good at the end of it and like if you ever see a really good tv commercial anywhere online on tv like the director has done a like an incredibly good job on that because mm. the battles he would have had to have won to get it to that position and obviously not just him other people as well on the team from the agency or his producer or whatever but the, a good job was done basically so mm. it's, it's a different world it's a different world and, and i suppose you said 28 days um well it was kind of like uh you know you out filming going to different locations um and how how many um commercials or how many yeah i suppose how many ads or commercials um have been produced from that since or i suppose is the plan you know to produce 12 and and how long will they last for uh roughly a minute long each um and days and i don't know if, i don't know what the media is but i imagine they'd be on on uh, on air for a few years it's, it's mad 28 days i suppose it's kind of good turnaround time right well i, I don't know it's, i'm trying to think of it from like in a, a, a work layout that like you know 12 minutes worth of ads featuring different locations across an entire country 12 minutes in 28 days i kind of that seems like a really good turnaround time yeah oh. i guess yeah it was there was a lot to film yeah um, <clears throat> we were like the weather becomes a big factor and we bizarrely over 28 days got very lucky with the weather um there was we thought undoubtedly they'd have to be pickup days where it may have lashed rain in you know dingle or mayo or something like that and you know the client doesn't want a certain place in the lashing rain so you have to go back but we, we rarely got lashing rain which is kind of unheard of for a you know a full month long shoot so um that's great and, and is the client always will say for the likes of dingle is it always going to be fall to ireland or could it be like the dingle board of whatever or is that client you're dealing with fall to ireland the whole time well there's just so many layers like we'd be i'd be dealing with the agency who'd be dealing with the client and then sometimes i'd chat mm. to the client but but then the client would have to deal with like and you're correct in saying that the client would have to deal with county tours and boards and all of this sort of stuff so there's layers and layers and layers of people <laughs> who have to approve stuff and and uh and have their say in stuff as well because i think each county is probably have to give up part of their marketing budget to make the ad mm. from their county and stuff and if you're giving up that then you have a say and <laughs> there's just so many so it's it's quite amazing that the videos turn out well considering the amount of voices that have an opinion on it you know yeah and and you know like dingle mayo uh donegal you know all beautiful places mm -hmm. by any chance were you in limerick at all um no. <laughs> See, i'm from i'm from limerick you see and no you're gonna i don't know i'm, I'm not gonna say anymore here um <laughs> we were on the shannon we were on the shannon Ah, the Shannon's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. there you go. You don't see pictures on the Shannon or Yeah, sure. We we leave it at that there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Um, and I suppose, uh, Brendan, before um, well, I'll take you back a bit. Um, which is becoming a bit of a catchphrase in this podcast because it's the only way I can transition and bring people back to the start. Um, but secondary school. Um, you obviously attended secondary school in Cork, didn't you? Yep, in Ballincollig, Clash to Column. Ball Oh, very good. Jeez, I've actually had a couple of guests on so far who've attended class at Cullum. It's good school. Seems like a very, yeah, it just, well, it seems like it's now. I've, I've heard it way too many times. Um, and uh, if I have my kind of my facts right, um, you wanted to be a football coach yeah. when you were in secondary school. Up until about 16, I would have coached with the FAI and I was coaching a local team and stuff and a football manager, addict, um the computer game um and uh yeah that's kind of what i wanted to do um my summer job as i said was coaching with the fai and um and then after transition year i started to get into um filmmaking and uh then my kind of direction started just to push towards 
not just filmmaking but kind of design and just i guess multimedia but all within the orbit of filmmaking yeah that's and and how how did that kind of uh, come about do you reckon i mean what what kind of clicked um that summer of uh ty or fourth year and fifth year what made you realize that you know geez this is actually what i want to do it was so much crack um it was we made a we made a film just for the laugh in transition year not as a project just Mm. as i remember sitting next to a lad in class who was into filmmaking and he was just telling me about some stuff he made or whatever and we said i was me being me was just like we should make a film not knowing what that entails so we went and did it pulled together a bunch of people from a year and we just had like the one of the biggest laughs i've ever had in my life and and it's just like it's the same now it's just like if you pull together a group of people to make something creative it's like it's just a buzz like it's just you're not pulling together just to do a job that no one cares about. It's something different. And it's just, there's, there's an energy that cannot be matched anywhere else. And I really, really buzzed off that. And I, and I made some of my best friends on that shoot. And I was just hooked after that and just wanted to do it more and more. So that's what I did. I just made more and more videos or comedy sketches or whatever. And, uh, just kept doing it and haven't stopped since okay and and, and because you, you write as well yeah 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 oh, in, in does that, does, does, yeah sure but like does does that kind of um do you think well i suppose do you think you're a good writer um so i th- yeah um i'm good at writing ideas and i guess stories and coming up with concepts yeah. and i guess i'm good at writing i write all my own treatments or like pitch documents or whatever you want to call it um so i guess i am um i don't really have much experience writing for example film scripts like the actual scripts and dialogue and stuff um but i work with someone who's um amazing at that but where i'd be quite good is writing overall story and arcs and and all of that sort of stuff so yeah i i'm good at writing i'm good at I think my strengths would more be in coming up with ideas, but I'd, yeah, I'd say I'm a good writer in a sense. Yeah. Sure. And and where do you feel that kind of skill comes from? Does that, do you, do you pick that up over time or do you feel you always had that kind of creative, um, I suppose, sense when you were younger? I was always, always very creative. Um, my mother was always very creative. She went to art college, um, in mm-hmm. Cork and just would have always been encouraging us to, be creative um i was also a piss taker in school um a kind of a class clown sort of a character um and always trying to make comedy sketches and all of that sort of stuff so i definitely think there's a lot in being a piss taker and if you know if and when i have kids and <laughs> i'll get a call from a principal about them taking the piss in the <laughs> class as long as they're not throwing rocks at the teacher, I'll be I'll be quietly proud. I think um, <laughs> they're gonna hate. They're gonna hate you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, that's that's wonderful to hear because um, I did want to ask you um, how kind of supportive your parents were um, with you wanting to go off and do uh, multimedia. Um, because uh, just last week uh, I, I had interviewed uh, Deirdre Cochran, who's a creative director at Chapter. Um, and we spoke, we, we kind of touched on the whole idea of um, a lot of parents being hesitant of letting their children go into creative, uh, well, I suppose the creative industry, um, because the, I think it's a, it's a lack of like knowledge and a lack of awareness. Um, but they kind of think, geez, like what, what kind of like what kind of jobs are you going to get with that sort of a thing? Like, you know, going around with a camera or a, a paintbrush mm-hmm. or whatever it is. Um, but were your parents uh, as you know, were they supportive of, of your kind of decision with that? yeah un- unbelievably so they never questioned anything i wanted to do like that but i was always mm. fairly driven and i was never sitting on my arse doing nothing you know or like i always had interests i always had something going on now it mightn't have been something that would make me money but i was always doing something and they always saw that as something to be encouraged 
um always like mm. my mom more on the creative side my dad i guess more on the i guess more on the the business side of things um mm-hmm. but our marketing side or whatever but they, i don't know they all just got it and they all just loved seeing me doing stuff and creating stuff and weren't bothered that i didn't i wasn't going doing business or law or anything like that um they were just they just wanted to see me doing what i wanted to do and and i i knew what i wanted to do so i mean they they just love to see that like what more what more can you ask for um, yeah, no, no not once no and they supported me whenever i needed to like whenever i needed to buy a first camera and stuff like that they were always there and um my mother would always be the person who'd when i was living at home be the first person i'd show edits to and stuff like that so like incredibly supportive that's great to hear because you know I, i've helped out with the uh, cit open days um when you know we, we could be on campus before in the past um and it, it's mad because a lot of time i'll have like you know fifth years and sixth years coming up to me and i'm like oh you know what do you want to do or what you, you know what's the crack like and it's like their their parent will be like hovering off them or it's like uh yeah they're going to do biochem or it's like yeah my, my mom wants me to do uh, she wants me to do this or it's like oh yeah my dad really wants me to do this and i think then when i actually when, when i go into college then um and i'm surrounded by so many people there's no one saying oh yeah my parents wanted me to do it either through a, a case that they went off and finally picked something for themselves or that they just buried the fact that their parents wanted them to do it mm. um but there's there's nothing worse than seeing your entire career which you'll spend you know the bones uh, of 40 yeah. 40 50 years doing um and it was your mammy and daddy's choice you know oh, that man. support from your parents is, is is so key i've spoken to people in their like finally year of medical school like six or seven years later being like i don't really want to be a doctor anymore and you're just like oh my god can you believe I, that I, I, yeah i can i can happily say um and it might be from my own social circles but I, I've met a few people doing medicine <clears throat> and not one of them want to go into medicine after college. Oh, they're no. extremely bright, um, good grades. Um, they're well able to have the crack as well. Um, and they're obviously able to balance it out, which is a great thing to see. But not one of them are like, I cannot wait to I get know. into the medical. You know, they're like, oh, man, I can't wait. You know, and yeah. it, it, it is sad to see. Um but yeah, no, it, it is lovely in comparison to see that your parents would have been so supportive for your choice there, which is great. Yeah. Um, so I suppose 2007, uh, you started multimedia in CIT. Yeah. Um, now, the great thing about this is I think you're one of many CIT alumni that I've interviewed now. Um, and if anything, um, well, we'll get into it. <laughs> um, but it, it shows the caliper of students that come out of CIT, which is something I'm, I'm a huge advocate of and very fond of. Um, but how, how was your experience uh, with the multimedia course at the time and CIT itself? Um, it was good. Um, <laughs> it was good. Uh, it, I thought four years was too long. I kind of got bored in the last two years and multimedia was quite a new course that it kind of hadn't really figured out what it wanted to be and it started to figure out that towards the end of my four years it was almost like we were guinea pigs and it started to push in more of a technology direction whereas I wanted to push into a film direction so I kind of butted Mm. heads with some of the lectures in the end which I found very frustrating but um but that was just the end um I still did what I wanted to do as I'd always do um but as a whole i thought the course ticked a lot of boxes for me i didn't want to go to film school because i didn't just want to do film so it allowed me to be able to try out filmmaking try out web design try out you know sound design graphic design animation um marketing pr or like all of these things and i'm not like i'm not saying you like learn all of those things from it but it gives you a taster of that and 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 like it was very centered on web design and i did not want to be a web designer it was the weakest at web design but Mm. i came out of it being able to design my own website and i wouldn't be able to code something from scratch but i was able to understand code from you know for what it is and being able to adapt it and take templates and make them into my own or whatever so 
as a whole, it was it was a good course because it 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 forced me to have to hone my skills in mm. in different types of media. So, and that has been super helpful. I'm so glad I did it rather than going to film school or something like that and just focused on film because I think it really really stood to me. Um, yeah. but as yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, it it sets you up for your kind of um, your early days of your career, like. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, and I felt like I remember going to an open day in UCC, and I just felt all of the courses were just so broad and like unspecific. You could do business or BIS or commerce or film, but it's never practical. And it's just like, and like it's it was good. Obviously, if you want to be a lawyer, you do law, or a doctor, you do medicine, mm-hmm. or a nurse, you do nursing. But some of the courses my friends are doing and they've all gone on and gotten jobs in business or whatever. But I just found it so generic. I remember being in UCC open day and being like, there is literally zero. It just seemed like a bunch of courses for people who didn't know what they wanted to do, but wanted a degree in some sort of thing that would help get them a job. And absolutely fair enough, but not for me. And I liked Mm. how CIT and techs in general are that bit more specific. There's more niche stuff in there. Um, and I like that, and yeah, and also like, yeah, I just found it surprising that a course like multimedia, considering the world we are in now, and which was definitely building towards at the time, is such a multimedia world. I couldn't believe how these courses aren't thronged with people. Like I think we had like a core group of about thirteen or fourteen people every year, which is just bonkers. But I think it's bigger it's now. But yeah, I did. I, I enjoyed it. I mean, same like any college course, really. It's like, it's not the most amazing thing in the world. It is, I guess, it is what you put into it. Like, you know. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it was great overall. I'm really happy I did it. Um, and, and like, did you get much kind of, um, like you, you kind of brought up the fact that, um, you know, with the text that they are much more, um, I suppose, experienced, you know, they're more practical. Um, and I suppose maybe this has happened in recent years, um, but definitely with my own course, um, like we've worked with like a load of different like Cork uh, businesses um, and some national brands. Um, I think like last year, um, which I've only actually remembered now, weirdly enough, but like we, we shot our own um, kind of short, I suppose like more of a commercial really. Yeah. Um, but we, we did one uh, for, for Jim Plus Coffee that um, we um got to show at the live case but never um we, we weren't we weren't able to kind of um put it up online or, or publish it anywhere uh, if if that's the right terminology yeah um but but during your time uh, in cit they, i suppose and again multimedia was just new um but did you get much kind of um industry experience did you have a placement for example or did you have businesses come in or was there any kind of collaboration in that sense uh no <laughs> not okay. not really from my experience no um maybe there is now uh no there was i don't think there was any work experience either okay. again it's probably and changed now but no so did, did you kind of did you do anything on a i suppose outside of college then during your four years did you get involved with any projects or how did that go for you um I always would have been doing extracurricular stuff like making films or sketches or whatever mm-hmm. and and trying to do good stuff like like whenever I had to make a film for my final year project. For the most part, I was trying to make it for myself rather than for my course, you know, because um, I was really interested in it. So some of the some of the projects we were given really i guess helped to fashion my direction of where i wanted to go and stuff some of them were quite interesting but in fact i know they do work experience now because my cousin was in the course a good few years after me and he would have been looking for work experience so again the course was very new and it was evolving but yeah <coughs> it's it's definitely developed um and I, I suppose it kind of you know it's it's known that when you came out of college that you would have done a lot of work, um, I suppose, in 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 music videos, um, yep. and you kind of started with like emerging and upcoming artists. Um, I suppose again, it was kind of early on in your career, so you couldn't have jumped <laughs> to the likes of a uh, hosier, you know, fresh out of college. Um, and now, in saying that, you did it after you know, only a few years, um, yep. which is, is uh, quite um, you know uh, admirable. 
Um, but yeah, I suppose when you came out of college, um, what was the kind of job market like for you? Did you, you know, get straight into a startup with, you know, graphic design that you would learn from multimedia or did you kind of freelance around? Uh, what was the playing field like and what did you do in it? I just kept making music videos, I think, and I probably would have been doing some corporate videos and stuff on the side, but the music videos mm. were what really excited me. And actually it was, it was, um, there was a module in my final year in CIT called uh, Experimental Video. And as part of that, we had a brief to create um, an experimental video to an instrumental piece of music. And nice. I would, yeah, and I would have picked uh, a track from uh, an album called Feel Good Lost from a band called Broken Social Scene. And that would have been my first music video. And my whole, my I love the name of that album. So my whole brief was to like capture the essence of that phrase, Feel Good Lost. And then I made mm -hmm. this quite ethereal, trippy kind of video. And I love doing it because I love the music. And at the end of that, I threw it up online on YouTube and it didn't have a video it already. And fans of the band started to like pick up on it and really enjoyed it, which was a buzz for me. So I just kind of wanted to do that again and again. So I just, I think after college, I just kept, but I would, I wasn't like making music for like local bands. I was actually, I guess, big into music. So I was sourcing these tracks, which maybe from an artist that would have been doing very well mm. and, you know, didn't have a video. So I was kind of making videos for like tracks that didn't have a video already and like just throwing them up online. So they were kind of the official, unofficial video and they were just getting traction, which was a buzz. And I was like, making these videos like every two or three weeks and they weren't like hosier videos with actors and stuff these are more just like experimental videos with like you know abstract footage and a lot of layering and colors and stuff like that and i was able to turn them out really quickly but my editing skills got better and better very fast and um i was just being creative all the time which really helped i was making no money but it didn't really matter you know i was just living at home and and uh, constantly churning out stuff. So that was. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's really great to hear because I suppose I have two questions in, in, in I suppose, in response to that. My, my first one is uh, for your, I suppose, your FYP when you did the uh, Feel Good Lost video. Um, you know, you were proud of it. The fans liked it. Um, not sure if the band themselves picked up on it or shared it or whatever. But how how was the kind of um, reception from from the college? Then did they did you get any feedback? Did they you know because often um, you know art can be a very subjective thing. But considering the fact that the fans uh, liked it as well, um, did you did you hear back from the college on it? Yeah, of course. They were like, and this is why I'm kind of slow to give. I mean, that was a great start for me, but I'm slow to give CIT credit because, I mean, that was from that that project was given from a lecture I think it was just who had no interest in filmmaking who was always pushing mm -hmm. me against filmmaking it felt like just one of his throwaway modules that he did just, just that, given to, given to him by the department just to check off yeah, the list like exactly or like you have to do something different this year so like to tick a box mm -hmm. and he, he, he there was no enthusiasm from him I remember mm -hmm. him not getting that video I think I might have gotten like fucking 55 percent or i don't know 60 percent or something yeah but i was very proud of it and that is kind of when my relationship with cit in the last year or two i kind of stopped giving a shit like i was i was like i was like i really don't care if you gave that 55 percent because all mm -hmm. of these fans are loving it you know and it was like there was the real world and there was college and yeah. once i was doing what i wanted to do and expressing myself I should have been rewarded for that. And, but I was just dealing with someone who just was not interested in filmmaking and, and I wanted to do filmmaking. So I was kind of like, I don't really care what you think. Like your 55% is not going to get me down on this because I'm very proud of it. And it's getting a reaction with people who I want a reaction from. So, I mean, that transcends any score or result or, or college grade, like, you know, and anyway, yeah yeah i think you're right there. i think it shows that there is like a huge gap um i i think 
you know, uh, in recent years and, and definitely for my own course, it's improved. But I think that there will always be a gap between academia and industry um, and what's kind of ex- what's accepted and not accepted in college will often be picked up um, in a different perspective uh, by the actual industry, you know. Absolutely. And like for every lecture like that, there were lectures who are much more encouraging of stuff like that. And, and mm. it just depends on who you get. And college at the end of the day is like I really... I owe a lot to my course because it allowed me, as I mentioned, to focus on a bunch of different stuff that eventually became incredibly valuable to me. Um, but, but I mean, it's kind of like if anyone thinks they're going to go to film school and just sit there and do nothing and not do extracurricular work and expect to come out the other end as a filmmaker, and I'm, I'm sure the same can be said with absolutely everything, you're, you're joking. Like, it doesn't matter. And the same goes for like some people who can pass with you know, all A's and because they're ticking all of the boxes you need to tick. Um, especially in the creative field, it doesn't matter at all. You know, it's like, like you don't, like if you're going, if you have a brilliant script or a brilliant film, no one's going to go, yeah. well, did you go to film school and what grades did you get? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, it's just, good film is a good film. Like, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter at yeah. all. Um, I've kind of yeah. gone on a tangent there, but... No, but no, it, no, no. Of course, it, yeah. Nice college is what you I make, think, um, really. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 you know, again, I said it earlier before the actual interview, but I, I am so used to like uh, interviewing people who, you know, had, had studied commerce or business, or were all working in kind of a corporate world. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it is nice and, and almost refreshing to hear um someone who had um I suppose a different experience uh in college um but is faring fairly well for themselves in their own industry you know um and is doing well but may not have had the same kind of um i suppose experience in college um so that that is good to hear i mean if you fail college and like you failed all your grades and stuff i guess it's not a great sign for like you going into the workplace but like college is just (laughs) college is a i guess if you can just get through it and pass everything it's probably a good sign that you can just get your head down and work on tasks you know but i don't know there's obviously high academia jobs which definitely would require someone with high academia grades but when you're in the creative field it's like if it doesn't matter really and like the, the side that matters is you're able to work when you're comparing that to college but it's really about what you can create that matters you know and I, yeah yeah <laughs> great great um no again nice nice to hear you know and i, yeah. I suppose kind of com- coming out of college then um y- as you said you, you worked mostly on uh music videos you would find kind of uh upcoming or emerging artists and yeah um i suppose a fan made music video if you would um yeah. and i guess kind of like genuinely from my own research uh 2011 2013 is a bit blurry um when did feel good lost come around when did you kind of set that up and when did it become official i would have said like official as in officially a business probably years later but around that time it became a thing and i would have had websites for Mm. it i would have i like even up until now i still i always was playing with the idea of feel good lost and what is it and is it my director name? Is it like, is it a business? Is it a music label? Is it what? Um, I think in those years, we definitely would have created it um, and used it as probably a vehicle to to make anything really, make music videos, to make sure. corporate videos, to make, and then it became a music label when we started to get more and more into music and just became everything um yeah and I, have you ever been like struck with copyright um <laughs> having taken the name from uh, the band no the, the one of their no no okay i don't think it'd be a very good look good look for a band no but i wasn't like coming Probably out with not. an it was a different it's a different context as well so yeah no that, that's that's good to hear um <laughs> yeah I, I suppose yeah, you know, it, it is weird for me because I, I am used to looking at a, kind of a LinkedIn profile and going down through the years and asking about experience. 
Um, but I genuinely, you know, I, I, I have exams like in two weeks. I don't have a lot of time to edit this. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think like the, the, the next thing I could, I could really find was um, Young Wonder, um, which would have been kind of, from, from my own understanding, would have been one of your first kind of big kind of projects, if I'm right in saying that maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Young Wonder was, uh, it came together through, to I'm I guess meeting great people like you know and um when you I think when you put yourself out there and you're constantly working on different projects and reaching out to people and doing different things you get noticed and if you're especially if you're doing creative stuff you'll end up meeting like-minded creative people and I would have and uh, Stephen Granger CVG would have been a champion of young people and still is a champion of young people doing creative stuff mm. in music especially but in any field really and he would have always gotten them on the air and on red fm and had them chatting and he would have done that with me a, a number of times back then and he would have separately to me he was championing another um kind of creative young person trying to do their own thing in uh ian ring and put us together and tried to get me to make a music video for him which i did and me and Ian became friends and then we were just I remember showing him um some music I was into at the time and which kind of reminded me of his stuff and anyway long story short decided to form a band um based on that music music we were listening to and that became Young Wonder and we pulled Rachel in and um and I just having you having all my multimedia skills was like I'll make the artwork I'll make the videos you know having made all these music videos I kind of had a, an idea of and at that stage I I made a lot of music videos and a lot of them were becoming official so I was getting used to like the marketing behind it and you know mm. to, to release a music video it's you know featured on different blogs and this is this is pre-spotify and um I kind of thought I had an idea of how to release something and and then was like, I'll make Feel Good Lost the label and Ian and Rach made an EP. We released it and it's probably still one of the most successful things we released to date. Like, you know, it just did really well and that kind of led to a whole other world where we're like, they're touring and playing gigs and collaborating with other artists, people who are like some of my best friends to this day, like, you know, Dahi and people like that um mm. so just kind of it kind of that really opened me up more to the music scene and which became a big part of my life as well um but it also was good because it kept me making music videos and it was bringing in a bit of money and and then if, like through doing that led me to like working with a band called talos years later where i would have made which and the videos for that would have really helped me to mm. to get more commercial work for myself and to find my style and stuff like that so so yeah, yeah. Uh, i suppose you know er early days uh in terms of like uh commercial or you know corporate work um was it more so kind of like local car brands or yeah did, did you kind of hit that kind of national front at a early stage or no um, like who who did who yeah so who who did you work with um in the commercial side of things um oh, say uh, you know out of college 2013 area all that you know those, those times it would have been true a lot of it would have been through my dad my dad would have had a pr and marketing company called fusion in cork and would have been just doing videos for their sort of clients like striker and um quintus and d different people like this and and then i would have done some stuff for like Fota and like anyone who was kind of clued in on i guess what's going on in cork kind of i guess might have heard of me and got me to do stuff so just bits like that and mm. but it was only when i did the hosier video it, that kind of brought me real exposure which led to me getting signed to production companies who make ads which would have led to me making ads and stuff like that i could never go as someone who isn't attached with a production company you know to make ads to direct commercials like it's just never going to happen you need a production company to lead that you know when 
did you actually shoot the video for Take Me to Church? I th- oh, you probably know better than me. Um, I think it was maybe 2013 or maybe 14. Yeah, I think it, it, 2014 is when it came out on, on YouTube. But I oh, feel well, like... No, um, then it was... Depending on... It was probably then, so 2013, 2014. Um, yeah. Yeah, around then. Um, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a great story because 1,500 euros it cost to make. Um, yeah. And at the moment, it almost has 400 million views on YouTube. Yeah, it actually, there's two YouTube, separate YouTube video clips. One is a Vivo clip and one is his own clip. So I think it actually has over 700 million. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Which I feel like I feel like uh, I feel like no, no. Everyone, everyone says that, and I feel like a dick for correcting them on it. But <laughs> no, 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 no. This an is extra, a learning experience. It's an extra three hundred million. Like it's <laughs> absolutely no, no. I absolutely agree. Uh, I know mm-hmm. in future I will be uh, checking the bills for people. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and I suppose I have it noted here that um, now you can go against me on this as well. But it's, <laughs> you kind of got the job based on karma yeah um yeah that yeah so yeah um, that is correct um well so i was becoming the person who is i guess making music videos in ireland or one of the people and Mm. as i mentioned i was making all these abstract music videos and i was kind of getting pigeonholed into being the person who does that so and a lot of the videos i was enjoying or online were more narrative based stuff with actors and drama essentially like short film in a kind of music video context or whatever so I started to try and branch out and do stuff like that um and I made I think I made two music videos in that vein the first one got it completely wrong the second one actually came on a lot and made a a hosier-esque sort of video quite well Mm. and then i came across and again because i was you know releasing because i was very involved in the music at this stage and i was you know releasing young wonder and and i just had an ear to the ground what was coming out you you built a brand for yourself essentially yeah yeah and but i was very clued in to what was coming out and i came across hosier released his ep i mean he was a nobody you know like i mean he was just a small artist trying to get attention like everyone else and he had this ep out which and i think four of the tracks on it like are all some of his biggest tracks now not just take me to church there was like from eden and um i can't even remember what else was on it but they're all massive tracks now it's just incredible songs i remember hearing it and being like fucking hell this is insane and like it's the same thing as like sometimes people don't know something that's really great until they're told by like the BBC or MTV or something like that. Mm. Um, I remember posting that on my Facebook and like you might get one or two likes. I'd be like, listen to this. Um, but I I remember the day I found it and I tweeted about it and I would have bought it on Bandcamp. And that day I would have been contacted by them to make a music video. It was, I remember it was half an hour after I tweeted about it. So I just assumed they might've saw my tweet, be looking for a video and got in touch. But, um, Niall from Ruby works, his label contacted me maybe about a year later after doing some radio interview and explaining how it came about and corrected me and saying that, it wasn't actually because I tweeted it. It was like they were considering a bunch of people and and I was one of them. And but I was the first like it was available on Bandcamp as as a free yeah. as a free download or you could name a price. And I was apparently the first person on the planet to name a price and bought the EP for like a tenner, whereas everyone else was downloading it for free. So they were like that guy we're considering for a video just bob was the first person to actually buy this so that's good karma so we should go with him so that's how it happened that's bloody amazing yeah i like that yeah <laughs> for, for, uh, for the for the for the, for the price of a tenor uh you, you got to uh, direct it the church essentially I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like how much did you pay for your career uh tenor i know it's exactly <laughs> um i i, I suppose 
what was the creative process then like uh you know behind taking the church um you know did, did you have an idea in your head straight away because obviously um and i would assume that there was no um there might have been um but were you kind of being uh strategic we'll say in terms of buying that i feel like you were supporting an industry that you were fond of more so than being like oh, i'll put a tenner in here now and the boys will love me and i'll get a nice job out for myself no 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 no, no. these weren't yeah. money making jobs at all these were just like amazing songs that i wanted to make a video to you know it was yeah. like it was, there was nothing there's no other ul- ulterior motive behind that or whatever um of and that was like this crazy amazing song that I couldn't believe no one was picking up on. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, I, it was just very cinematic. And as I mentioned, I was trying to make these cinematic sh- short films, essentially. And this song could not have came at the right time. So I was like, I want to make a cinematic music video. So I came up with a plot very similar to the one that's there now. Then Andrew suggested an angle on it. And so I rewrote it based on that angle. And then we just went and shot it. It all came together super quickly. Um, did did Andrew suggest the kind of um, I suppose in terms of the visuals, the kind of um, attack on homophobia? Yeah. Um, was that always something that was going to be like in there no matter what? Or um, no, that that was, wasn't. I think my idea originally was something about it was kind of more about the like suppression of intelligence in a kind of in that sort of um, totalitarian state. And then he really liked that. But at the time, the Sochi Olympics was going on in, in Russia. And there was it was big news that LGBT community was being like really suppressed. And there was a lot of protests and then there was a lot of beatings and stuff going on like that. And it was big news at the time. It's very topical. And he suggested because something like that would have worked a lot in in my within the idea I'd come up with. So Andrew was just like, that's topical. You know, that's something he really cared about. So he was like, let's do something to do with that. So it was a fucking amazing idea. Incredibly ballsy Brilliant. thing to take on, but we had nothing to lose really and didn't have to play it safe at all because whatever. Um, yeah, we just did it. And what was great was, I mean, we just... Again, I had just done so many, so many sketches and videos and helped out with other people's stuff that I was able to pull together a crew of friends and fellow creatives to come and help. And, you know, mm. it, again, it was one of those shoots. It was great crack. Um, and, yeah, just came together very organically and cut it in like two days, sent it on to the label, was asking when they'd like to put it out. They were like, tomorrow. <laughs> Normally it's like takes weeks. <laughs> Yeah, they wanted to. Fo- <laughs> they they wouldn't admit to this now, but I remember them wanting to focus on Ireland for the next year, and I was kind of. I remember challenging them and being like, "I think this could, you know, do well internationally." They were like, "No, we're going to focus on Ireland." I remember mm. being like, "I think this could go a bit bigger than that." And then we released it the next day, and the next night, Andrew Hosier Byrne texted me, being like. My friend posted it on Reddit and it's um, getting a bit of traction and woke up the next morning and it had like 350,000 views and later that night Jeez. it had millions and then and then you can ex- you expect I, you expect it to slow down and it just doesn't for 2 years. Yeah. For 2 years. I think, I think it's funny because I think back then if you were in an interview you'd expect like the the interviewer to be like uh, it it went viral, didn't it Brendan? You could say it went viral, you know. It it's went not absolutely really uh, viral. kind of a, <laughs> it's not really a done said word anymore is it no but it was think, it was really like it was a very privileged thing to be able to watch something yeah. go viral like that and like from the, from the inside out you know with no intention for it to go viral it was and seeing seeing all the little pieces and of how it come, came together i mean it doesn't really teach you much yeah. but it's just really interesting to watch you know there's no because everyone is obviously looking for those ingredients for some, of something to go viral, but and I mean there is some to an extent that you have to have, but the rest yeah. is just up to the gods. Like you know, it's just fate, it's just timing, it's just the right people, yeah. everything clicking, everything clicking. Like so many things have to click, and it just did, and it was it was absolutely insane watching it go as astronomically big from Andrew's attic 
to my bedroom <laughs> to my aunt's back garden to my aunt's house to my friend's apartment everywhere all the locations where the video was shot where it was recorded from all of these small broke creative spaces to one of the biggest songs on the planet in the space of a few days it's just amazing it's crazy crazy and i suppose like you know obviously at the time um um i suppose uh internationally you know it was it was it was receiving um what's the what's the word i'm looking for now it, you know it was popular people people enjoyed it and i think yeah. i want to edit this maybe I, I don't know i probably won't um it's okay for sometimes to, to not know <laughs> the, the word you need in a podcast but i suppose like on a national front was there any kind of like negative reception from ireland um because it is quite a um an out there subject um given the, the you know um i suppose ireland's past um and some people who live here who are quite conservative um was there any issues like that you know not at all i think and it was it came maybe in a year or two before the gay rights or the gay marriage referendum and mm. i remember irish times saying in the thing i think they were like top 10 things that helped you know with the yes vote or whatever and that video was one of them yeah. which was crazy um I think I think it just like having something like that in the mainstream makes it very difficult for people if your views are any bit homophobic or whatever makes it harder mm. for you to speak them which is always a good thing um but I guess it just probably like anything else opened up the conversation and you know if this is something that's being shared and people are watching you know two lads kissing each other it's i don't know it was just it just normalized things a bit more you know and i think there's been a lot of stuff like that that if i don't know it just helps to normalize things and allows more things like that to come out and and like i remember being at body and soul festival drunk at like one in the morning and chatting to a friend <laughs> who chatting to a friend of a friend and them being like oh you made the hosier video it's like, oh my God, um, you know, my friend came out because of that. And you're just like, what? Right. You know, it's like, there's probably tons of stories like that. And which is lovely, you know, it's like, it's a bit insane. Like, you know, you don't know what to say to something like that, but it's just, I don't know. Yeah. It made a difference, you know, um, which is amazing. Jesus. I think that's, that's so, that's so um, vast on a, like a creative level. Like I'm, I have a nice old chirp on my shoulder because I'm like, oh, look at me, I'm making a podcast, but I don't think anyone's going to come out because of my podcast. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, uh, look, so I don't, I don't. Way. No, I mean, look, I'm doing stuff on a bigger scale now, I guess, mm. budget wise and stuff, but I am very comfortable in the fact that I will never, most likely never do anything that would blow up like that again. It's so, it's such a one off and it's such a thing that such a right. tiny minority of people on this planet will ever get to experience and it was just an absolute privilege for it to happen and to watch it happen and and like I've no doubt that my career would have eventually gotten to this stage but it was like it was kind of on an upward trajectory if you imagine just like a line going up this kind of just a steady hill but it was going up and it kind of just spiked it up a good bit it kind of just chucked me picked me up from a helicopter yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of 300 meters up the mountain you know it just kind of it was the accelerator in it all really you know yeah it was a big catalyst it just moved things on maybe about yeah. five years for me in the space of yeah. a few weeks that's mad yeah i feel like like what age were you when when you know this was happening because like in 2015 um he, you went to the um which i suppose um you know mtv the video music awards um at the time like that's pretty huge you know um like do you still feel i, I what 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 are your thoughts on that kind of like a, an award like because you know you've, you've you've won awards before especially with like the, the can sale um the, the awards there with the nominations was saying i mean like at the time for you was mtv was it a huge deal like were you like blown away like was it exciting like you know what, what was the experience like for you it was all of the all of those things it was but you know, it was also two years after I made that video. So, and so it was like mm. MTV Music Video of the Year. I was like, I made that video two years ago. It was, it was, it was very, as I said, that, that video kept, you know, it didn't stop. It just, or that song and that video just kept 
getting attention, getting attention, getting attention, getting attention. Just when it started to taper off, that happened. It was just very surprising. I thought that was actually eventually kind of the end of that. Um, it was super surprising. I remember finding out because a journalist got onto me over Gmail to interview me about my two VMA nominations. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah. and I had to Google it quickly and be like, holy shit. Um, okay, cool. It was fun. I got to go to LA and it was absolutely great crack. I mean, the award itself, like I'd say most awards, was a complete utter load of bollocks. Like, it's not about me. It's about it's a show like it's about getting big artists there and like I and someone told me when I was there I was like oh is Hosier going to be there I was like I don't know they're like well if he isn't you've got no chance because they like to give the award to Taylor Swift because she's going to come on stage and sing something or Kanye West because he'll probably say something that's that's what it was about so you learn very quickly which was a bit disappointing that it was just about optics it wasn't about skill or whatever but having said that mm-hmm. The best thing about that was being able to just put it on in my bio, like, you know, or just like hmm. put it at the end of my yeah. email. Like it, it really, I don't know. It didn't, it, uh, the award is not, it's not like a BAFTA or something like that. It's a load of bollocks, like, but it's, it's hmm. a big load of bollocks. Like, you know, um, uh, it's a big load of bollocks. You can put in a fucking <laughs> bio. If you, say, if you curse one more time, I swear to God. I'm not allowed. <laughs> no, of course, you're, of course you're allowed, but I've never had anyone curse before. So I'm like, each time you curse, I'm like, okay, this is going to have to be an explicit episode. I have to remind myself now to take this as explicit. The whole your video was explicit, like, you know, it'll get more people listening. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'll, I'll I'm actually, sorry. Um, I, I, no, 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 I'm, I'm not, genuinely no problem. I might, I might change the title to uh, interview Brendan Canty and in brackets, I'll say explicit. People yeah. might be curious and be like, oh, I'll listen to that now, I'll get an experience. Oh, Jesus. I'm telling yeah. you, marketing. No, do, do, yeah, yeah, do continue on though. Um, But I, obviously, like, I mean, LA, like, again, what, like, what age were you? Like, this is, this is like, you know, fairly you know early days like uh 26 yeah like it's crazy yeah i mean that's pretty mad like for for any for any irish lad like you know over the mtv <laughs> you know like lots of crap yeah. lads you know? yeah it was exactly you... it was like that and then the cork evening echo wrote a little article on it and they said uh cork men lose out at mtv awards and i just thought it <laughs> This local man disappoints town. Who's just like, <laughs> so it's like, like um, yeah, it's like the uh, the the Simpsons yeah, article yeah. or the news headline. Local man shouts at clouds. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, God, <laughs> um, I, I suppose then, like, kind of, um, you know, that that's obviously one kind of um chapter in um twenty sixteen. Then brings a, another kind of new height. Um, with uh, a commercial. Um, this time, um, uh, for Budweiser. Um, you know, a pretty big one that um we've watched in too many classes. To be quite honest with you, in in, in college, um, <laughs> I'm personally sick of seeing it. Um, <laughs> I've seen it enough times. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, how uh, you know, and just give you know people a bit of background. Um, 2016, you shot an ad for Budweiser, uh, and it featured Conor McGregor. Um, yeah. how did that come about? Um. Again, it was kind of good luck, I guess, because yeah. there was no, there was no, there was no tenor involved this time. I'd say no, no, but it was also like that whole. It was to promote a competition Budweiser running to incur to follow your dream, to encourage people to follow your dreams or whatever. And they were getting people to to you know to enter this competition. You'd have to be like, you know, I make podcasts or I I'm an artist or something like that, and they would. I don't know, help out with that in some way. Um, and I guess it was good PR for them because of the nature of the competition to get a young Irish director who's following his dreams. So um, that's kind of how I won that gig. Um, okay. I probably wasn't at the level to be directing big Budweiser commercials just on merit alone. I needed something like that to go my way as well. So... Yeah, that's 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 kind of how I still have to pitch against other people and win the job, but that definitely went for me. Um, um, yeah, so like, did you, you did you get it with Budweiser and then say to them, "I want McGregor," or like how how was no, that process? No, no, like? no, 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 no. They they were making an ad 
with McGregor and the agents, the ad agency would have kind of come up with the concept of the ad and then this is how it normally happens. And then you, yeah. would have, you would get the brief and they'd want you to pitch on it. And then I would basically create a pitch document being like, here's your idea. Now, this is how I am going to approach it. And this is how I would like to execute your idea. And you can, in those, you can bring your own ideas to the table, you know, um, and that's that's kind of what I did. Um, so they would have had McGregor attached already. It definitely wasn't my idea. Um, okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, and I suppose. Cool. Um, what is uh, Connor or or McGregor? Uh, did you did you talk to him in real life? Yeah. I, briefly. I assume, I, I assume he, he he wasn't just oh briefly really. He, uh, yeah, he. Well, that was. I guess he wasn't astronomically big. He was very big, but it was. I think during after we shot it before the ad was out was kind of when he would have knocked out Jose, Jose Aldo or whatever. So it was it, it well, after okay. that he it was went early days. It wasn't early days, but it was like kind of he was very big. Everyone knew who he was. He was a big ass name, but he was kind of someone who was achieving his dreams but wasn't fully there yet. And then once I felt, I felt like once he knocked out your man, he blew up. So between when we shot it and when it came out, he had blown up astronomically, which was cool for Budweiser. Mm. But um, he was he was sound. He was he was then back then he was very sound. He was easy to direct. Um, he didn't like to show up early, which I've heard is still a thing. Um, yeah, I think like, I'm, I'm the same. Yeah, yeah, you're like McGregor in that way. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember yeah. us, we were planning to shoot at dawn at like seven in the morning and he showed up at one o'clock in the afternoon, sort of a thing. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so I'm, not, I'm not that bad now, in fairness. Your early dawn, <laughs> your early dawn light is what you want as a director has gone out the window. So, yeah, yeah he was, a, but we shot the really first, post-production. we shot the first half of that in Crumlin, um, and I just had to, I had to pick a street and I just randomly, like completely randomly picked the street that he actually grew up on. So I think, mm. which was a mad coincidence, which when he got there, he was just like, oh, I grew up in that house. I was like, and the client were very impressed that I picked that street, but I just completely <laughs> did it by accident. Um, yeah. But he was very humble there. But then when we shot in LA, he was like, I guess more of a, a mad lad um showing yeah. up late but showing up in a maserati and fucking sorry cursing um and and doing doing donuts in the car park and just being a bit of an idiot like um jesus yeah 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 so there was two sides to him definitely a tale of yeah a tale of two sides yeah <laughs> I might see fellas doing that over in the States, but I'm pretty sure I saw a couple of lads there doing it in um, Ballon Colleague doing yeah. two donuts in the car. Do you know? Yeah, so, uh, fair play to them. Fair play to them. <laughs> um, I suppose, you know, like, you know, that it's a cool project to be able to get to work on something that, like, again, it's an international brand, um, yeah. an international figure, um, big budget in terms of, like, who's, you know, that they got in for it. Um, and I suppose I, d- I just want to touch on one part um, briefly. Like that ad was banned by RTE. It was banned by the ad, the, the, you know, the, the ASAI. Yeah. Um, and I, I suppose just from like a marketing perspective, the whole idea being that, you know, you can't, I suppose, advertise alcohol to children. Um, and the main argument put by the uh, ASAI was that uh, Conor McGregor, even though he's an extremely uh, violent um, and, and, you know, a, 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 you know, MMA star who absolutely, you know, bloody kicks the, the, yeah. the, the shite. I'm going to yeah. say my first curse word. Yeah, my you're own getting podcast, into it you know. now. Um, <laughs> you've ruined me. Yeah, um, yeah. So they pulled that because of that, because they were like, he's a children's star. Yeah. Um, and fair enough, you know, there's all the legalities involved in it. There's all this corporate stuff, you know, back and forth with Budweiser and the SAI and all that kind of stuff. How did you feel as, you know, the director, as the kind of the, you know, the creator behind that? Or, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you, were, you know, I like, were you like, you know, 
Yeah. No, it kind of he kind of got it more publicity, if anything. Like you know, it was like putting explicit on this podcast. It was like people <laughs> people for a while wanted to watch the band commercial with Conor McGregor. You know, it was still on YouTube and stuff. So, and it still had a yeah. good, it still had a run on telly for a few weeks. So, um, I really did nothing at all, did it? Not for me, anyway. I think it just got it more news attention and stuff like that. So. I'd already directed a Budweiser commercial with Conor McGregor, so it was fine for me. It didn't like not many people watch TV anymore, so like it was, it didn't really matter. Mm. Maybe before the internet, it would have been a, such a blow because now no one can watch your ad you shot. But now it was like it was on the internet and people were writing stories about it because it was banned and it didn't. Yeah, if anything, it, didn't really, it didn't. It was no, it was no skin off my back. Like you know, it was, it was a bit, it was a bit bad for Budweiser and Diageo or whatever, but. But um, yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was got it got it more traction. So, but like I mean, it, worse than that, I think Conor McGregor's antics didn't really do it any justice. Like because he just is a fool. Like you know, so um, so like I appreciate appreciate, appreciate the honesty. <laughs> it is like you know, and he's just like all his antics kind of doesn't really like doesn't really go a long way to inspiring young people or he, he's just not he's just not a good role model like you know so so his antics mm. and i think i can't remember what it was but there was something in around that time that he was doing which didn't make it a good look for budweiser to be putting on putting him as the main man that kids should be looking up to which is unfortunate because he should have been that person you know mm. but anyway yeah no yeah i agree Sad to see it, but um, I suppose you know, just 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 being cautious with time. Uh, 2017. Um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you filmed your first short, yeah. Uh, I would have made, yeah, for you, uh, for you. with um, Barry Keoghan, who's doing very well for himself, uh, Irish actor, and yeah, uh, Gabby Murphy. Um, that was, yeah, that was that was a great experience, and making your first short you kind of normally have to invest in it yourself so we would have taken money from uh invested maybe some money we'd have made in commercials like Budweiser or made another one for Sky Sports and kind of taken some of that fee and put it into I know my production company at the time Hinterland did the same and we kind of paid for it ourselves and um yeah that was a tricky project because I maybe was a bit arrogant going into it being like I've made tons of music videos I've made ads um, mm. you kind of expect that this is going to be no different and it was very different you know like making film it's there's, it's just a different art form so it kind of really it's, that process really scared me and um, I kind of felt a bit out of my depth now it came together really well but for a while I wanted to can it like you know I thought it was I didn't think it was, I thought it was, it, it wasn't great. Um, and then another editor came on board and got us to the shape it's in now. But um, it was a great, one of the great learning, um, one of the great learning projects in my life, you know, like, um, and then once you've made a short, it kind of makes you eligible to like apply for funding for another short and stuff like that. And hmm. that was brilliant, you know, it was, and now, kind of drama is kind of where I'm really pushing towards now so like that kickstart all of that you know and even being afraid and like you know there's bits of it that I'm unhappy about but more so it came off fairly well but I think more so in the process of how I dealt with stuff or how inexperienced I felt kind of really shook me to the point where I was like I never want that to happen again so I kind of went out of my way to make sure that didn't happen again and learned new techniques and and got more experience in that field and that really has stood to me i think so it was a really mm. important project for me that film and, and and say for example now like if i would say ala for example turned around to you tomorrow and was like oh let's watch for you how like um would you would you be able to sit down and watch your own work or oh yeah because um, you know obviously time... okay that's really good to hear yeah definitely I'm very proud of it, you know. Um, there's bits of it that I'd openly be like, "Oh, I wish I did that differently," or I know why that didn't work out, or something like that. But 
there's parts that I'm super proud of, you know. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. look, don't get me wrong. There's 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 work I've done which I never want to watch again, you know. That I wish was buried, and there's stuff that is buried, but there's some stuff that I'm very proud of, and it's something like that where I'm even proud of the moments where I'm like. I know I could have done that better and I, I know I could do that better now, but the only reason I'm able to do it better now is because I didn't really get it right the first time around, you know, and there's something to be proud of in that as well. Yeah. I think you just, just have to bloody just do it like to kind of gain that experience, you know, exactly, man. So, many, kind of... oh, so many people are just petrified of doing stuff, you know, for fear of, I don't know, rejection mm. or like people not liking it, but like, uh, it's just I know that can be terrified and I'm obviously scared of that as well sometimes but you just have to just do it like you know it's like you're not gonna you know by making a film like if, if that film failed it was like no one's going to kill me you know I wasn't going to be murdered because I made mm. you know you still wake up the next day and march on and do something else like you know it's like what's the worst that can happen like you know it's like <laughs> Um, yeah. you have to just if someone wants to be a musician or someone wants to be a filmmaker or someone wants to make podcasts or someone wants to do anything like the biggest thing is doing it like I remember when I was a filmmaker as a teenager in Cork and there was other filmmakers who were just like like super talented and like putting up amazing photos and making amazing clips and I was like god it was just like I'd love even just to have a bit of their talent but then like five years pass and you've made fucking a hundred are like tons of videos and like they're still not doing much and you realize that just in the act of you pursuing it and doing things and not being afraid of failure kind of can get you to that level you know it's just like it's it's the best thing to do like it's the best learning it's across any medium you know has has anyone said to you uh just ship it before just ship it yeah what do you mean uh, it, there's a, a fella, his name is Seth, uh, Seth Godden or Seth Godin. Oh, I actually yeah. don't follow him myself. Um, but I actually spoke to your father long before this podcast even started um, because I I wanted to do it, but I had no idea if I was able to. Um, and I think I took, like I'd say, a good 40, 50 minutes of your dad's time and just being like, what if I'm good, not good enough? And how do I get practice? And how how do I get better at it? And how do you do this? And how do you do that? And he literally just kept saying like, you know, if it fails, there's nothing's going to happen. Like, you just have to go off and do it. Like, he goes, the only way you get practice is by doing it. Yeah. He goes, the only way you'll be, he's like, you just have to ship it. Like, just do it. Like, he goes, you know, just stop talking about it. He goes, the only way you'll learn, the only way you'll get better, the only way you can get practice is by just doing it. And with each episode, and just like you, with each um, project, you know, you yeah. will learn and, and you will improve. Um, but you'll only do that if you throw yourself into the deep end and start doing it. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, um, it, it's, it's. Uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but um, just to the advice you've given there is very similar to, to your dad's. And my, fa- um, and my father's and... son. Uh, yeah. But it is, <laughs> but it is, it's like you could like, Jack, you could like go and watch a hundred tutorials and podcasts and read a million books and it doesn't matter. Well, it will give you some knowledge, but like, nowhere near the knowledge of just actually doing what you're doing right now you know and it's just like that is the biggest thing anyone can do and like you keep doing that or like if you want to do anything if you do it versus someone else who's not doing it you're going to get better than that person but anyway aside from that you're just going to get better for yourself like it's the best way to learn like Mm. it's the only way to learn properly especially in these practical things um yeah no i i 100 agree with you yeah um yeah, no, it's that it's good, good, good to good to hear that. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I suppose kind of um again for me twenty eighteen blurry year. How what did you get up into in twenty eighteen? Because I, I know twenty nineteen was was a very busy uh, year for you. Um, mm-hmm. you know, um, and and you know twenty twenty, um, I suppose you know four by four came out and you had kind of helped with that a small bit. I think maybe yeah, possibly yeah. yeah. But I suppose you know twenty eighteen. What what kind of went on there 20, 2018 mm. it was a very quiet year it was the year that I was <coughs> excuse me very um I was just worried it was just a bit of like no one was really getting on to me to make stuff um mm. wasn't really being asked to make that much commercials and commercials is kind of where I make 
my money, you know, and it was the music video thing was kind of I was pitching a lot, wasn't winning a lot for the kind of first time in my career, I guess you feel like like being a director is kind of like being a musician. It's like people kind of want the the hottest thing out there, you know, and like I wasn't really I didn't really have a anything that had blown up or whatever in the last while and my commercials while like including the Budweiser one it's like while they came out and did well they weren't really like you know exciting from a directing point of view like you know they weren't really like oh god we need that talent that made Conor McGregor walk around for a while like you know it you know it wasn't complicated like you know and they're not complicated just I don't I just didn't have I just didn't have people knocking on my door, but something, and I, it was, it was, it was kind of a year of like, you know, is this, is this, where is this going? Like, you know, a bit, I wasn't like freaking out or anything, but, but I won, um, I applied, we, we, we wrote me and Alan O'Gorman, who I wrote for you with, um, mm. he's a screenwriter. We wrote a short film script and submitted it for funding from Screen Ireland and in the summer we won that funding so we got we got awarded 50 grand to make a short film wow so which i would have went and made in 2019 so that was the biggest result for me in that year and even though people weren't knocking on my door i knew i had a short film that i was going to make set in cork and well, I was what excited. more could you want? Like your own, your hometown, like, you know, making exactly. a... so, and then in 2019, I made that. And so it was kind of a big year because that happened and that kind of changed my life, that short film. So, so, yeah. so it was a quite and, and year, tell me, transition year, I guess. Yeah. Just 2019 did bring that short film, which was uh, Christy. Yeah. Can and you then... tell me a small bit about Christy? um probably one of my favorite things i've ever done um yeah it was a short it's a short film i mean in a nutshell it's about a kid from knocknaheeny in the north side of cork uh i guess an underserviced area of the city um it's about a kid a teenager going for a job interview um and but more so it was just about the anxieties around you know um teenagers and just anyone especially in those areas the anxieties around them Absolutely. going for jobs like that or like the feeling like there's a huge stigma like massive you know? massive like yeah. more than anyone would ever understand like there's a huge stigma around especially when people in those areas about not feeling worthy of you know even just going to college or getting a part-time job and um and that's and the film was about that. It was about a character who was just going for a job in a DIY store and not feeling like he's worth it. And then the interviewer treats him like shit and he doesn't get the job. But kind of on the side like of all of that, it's bonfire night and he's given these, he comes across these kids from the area who are building a bonfire and he kind of has given them all this great, DIY advice on how to build it so you can see he's a leader and you can see he's very capable of very capable of you know everything you probably need to work in a DIY store you know like but he's just doing it in a different context about building bonfires and then and then it's kind of just about you know the support friends can give you uh, you know because there is a culture of especially in this country but I'm sure around the world of people friends putting you down and stuff like that like but and that happens at the start of this movie, but in the end, it's kind of like, you know, if we kind of support each other, we can do better, you know. And uh, it all was inspired by when I went up, I went up to Knocknaheeny, I don't know what year it was in, maybe 2016, to take photographs and ended up talking to some teenagers drinking cans around <laughs> around a bonfire. And, I'd, and they were like 16 or 17 and they were asking me what I was doing and I was telling them that I was taking photographs and he was kind of like, Oh, I'd love to do something like that. And I was kind of like, well, why don't you You just need to, you know, college is free. You just need to go to college. And they were kind of looking at me be like, no, you don't understand. Like not for me. 
and I just couldn't get it. And then I just, it always stuck in my head. And, and then there's just like a, a whole culture of that, you know, um, especially in these environments that are just kind of have it ingrained in them that they're just not good enough, you know, and there was other instances of that. So anyway, that was kind of what the film was about. And we ended up street casting a lot of it through, um, through uh, the cabin, which is this youth reach program set uh, up in Holly Hill out of a porta cabin, essentially that Gary McCarthy, um, who people would know as GMC, he was Cork rap, rapper mm. back in the day. Um, he set up years ago where he just, you know, teaches kids how to rap and make beats and and like he's, I mean. He'd never be described officially as a social worker, but he's probably one of the greatest social workers this country has ever seen. Like, you know, and he had just given all these kids from the area this incredible confidence and encouraging them to be mm. creative. And they were just the most wonderful, charming, creative, sweet kids. And we just cast a bunch of them and they just changed my world. Like, you know, it was suddenly we're just making this, sh- they just transformed the tone of the film and just like, gave it so much more heart and they were just magic you know and um we just had such a great experience they had such a great experience i had such a great experience everyone did and then from then on we just were like we have to do more with those kids so we started writing a feature film and then the short film did really well or came out and was really well received and off the back of that i'm uh, sorry so off the back of the short uh dan daniel power the lead actor who would never acted before got a part in Young Offenders um, nice. as um, Gavin Madigan. He, he has a key role in two episodes. And and then Chris Wally, the lead in Young Offenders, loved acting alongside him and was recommending him to his agent. And then he, and then he, he was chatting to his agent or whatever. And then or he was chatting to Chris's agent. And then I shared, showed them the short film and then they saw the short and loved the short and all to represent directors. So it got on to me to represent me. And then like suddenly I had an agent for drama and then, and then Jeez. I know it's, and then they set me up at all these meetings in London at the end of 2019, just to go over and have chats with these, you know, film for BBC war films, all these places. And I, I wasn't going in to pitch anything, but you know, they all watched my short. They all watched For You, my first short. um, And they were like, we love all these. What are you working on now? And again, I was not going into pitch anything, but I was like, oh, I'm actually writing a feature film based on the world of Christie, the short film you liked. They were like, yeah. oh, tell us about that. I was like, oh my God, I'm just going to pitch this film off the top of my head, which I did. And like, but was able to tell it in a much more casual, like unplanned way. And I was showing because a lot of the ideas for the film were inspired by things that might have happened while we're shooting the short film. And I don't know. I just told it. I I don't know. There's just a buzz and people liked it. And I came out of every single meeting with the feeling like you get whenever you've had like a really good date or something like that. It was like, holy, I was Mm. like, really like that person. I think that went really well. And then suddenly there was a bit of a bidding war for our feature film and um yeah and then we got like um a, a production company scott free like ridley scott's production company wanted to get on board with it and then the bbc got on board with it so we're currently developing that into a feature film with bbc films which is the craziest and best thing to ever happen in my life so that is where i'm at now um so that was amazing yeah, so well, well, well done, and congratulations, Brendan. Jesus, um, yeah, it's all fantastic fr- news. It's fantastic news, but it's also a film that's set in Cork, with all centered around all of these wonderful actors who, I guess, only ever acted in my film and maybe Young Offenders. And I don't, hmm. it's just such a buzz, you know, it's such great energy. I, I I think it's kind of um there's there's two there where it's like um I can't even think of the word again but I'm I'm just gonna throw it out there you know at one stage you paid a tenner for uh, an EP out of goodwill and landed a job and then at another stage purely from talking to a few lads drinking cans by a bonfire 
um, you had the inspiration which yeah. landed yourself into another kind of catapult to success of success rather um, it just shows that um, you have to kind of I suppose put yourself out there but also you can't just sit back and wait for these kind of things to happen to you like you know you have to bloody just you just have to kind of um, You're right, put yeah. yourself out there yeah. you know and, and just be proactive and just do stuff you know like you can't just sit around and be like oh my grades are good or oh you know I did this two years ago that was fairly good like you just constantly have to be moving forward yeah you're spot on and like you're I've never even thought of it like that I mean the Christie thing in that context but like I mean for no reason other than just I wanted to take photographs went up to Nakhnahini on bonfire night to take photographs and that inspiration for a film happened and I didn't come away that night being like I want to make a short film I came away from that night with really cool photographs which kind of inspired the idea of I would love to shoot something on bonfire night but also coming away thinking about that conversation I had with those young fellas which you know permeated and permeated in my head and eventually you know set the seed for what I'm doing now so but you're right I didn't sit down I was just even when I wasn't working I was still going up to take photographs and the art of just Mm. doing stuff and being creative and doing stuff for yourself that isn't necessarily to to make money or anything like that that's where good ideas come from and um yeah and you're never going to come up with like ideas like that just sitting by your laptop waiting for an idea to come to write a film you're just not like you know it has to come organically Mm -hmm. for the most part maybe some people can but for the most part those things have to come organically and 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 like the more the more the more you put yourself out there and the more you try and do creative stuff and like even stuff like and I know blind boy I know blind boy talks about it as well it's like but even just stuff like playing video games or keeping your mind active or not putting yourself down because you're taking time off for yourself for a week or like it's so mm. important just to keep active and stay happy and engaged and yeah and procrastinate and play and I mean play is so important chill out, chill out yeah and just be playful and like like I remember like last year especially I was just constantly trolling Red FM's Facebook page and like putting it up on my Instagram <laughs> And people are like, oh, Brendan's busy. But like, I was like, I was like, that actually was keeping my mind. And like, I was coming up with all these mad stories, winding people up. And and like, that was keeping me being creative. And I guess it goes back to like me being a piss taker in school. It was like, and you asked me, where did I become a good writer? It was like, probably from just being a piss taker and coming up with funny things to say. And just like, just being creative and keeping your mind ticking and like, like it's funny like like taking a piss on red fm <laughs> facebook page <laughs> winding people up like daily yeah. daily kept my mind creative and active and so when a job came along or i had to pitch and write a treatment on something more serious my mind was like um switched on and was like ready to go like you know rather than just like yeah. sitting on my arse waiting for work to come in i was always doing something like you know and yeah it doesn't like keeping busy and keeping doing something it isn't always like making a podcast every day or trying to make a film or write a film every day sometimes it's actually just like stepping away from that and not putting yourself under pressure to do that but trying to keep your mind occupied and be creative in other ways it can be as silly as painting a picture of your dad wearing a hat or winding up local radio stations you know it's like that <laughs> these are the things that yeah work for me i haven't painted my dad in a hat yet but i might do that today okay i, I was thinking i was like is he talking from experience here now no, or is no. he just putting words <laughs> i don't think um, i've seen my dad wear <laughs> Troy, what are you lovely curly head of hair in him that's true don't be hiding that no um but no look i, I suppose uh guys uh brendan's i say guys as if this is like a live or something it's it's absolutely not brendan's instagram is uh brendan feel good lost but i'm actually going to give an example of uh one of these trolls because just recently my friend barry has started trolling red of him as well <laughs> um no he, he has done this because i've shown him yours 
Um, but uh, yeah, Amazing. <laughs> I hope you're not. Uh, it, oh yeah, <laughs> you're after you're after inspiring others, Brendan. Um, but just here, here's one data from, and this is June 2015. So you've been at this for a while. Mm. Um, <laughs> so here, oh, Cork Red FM. When crows attack, Liz was attacked by a crow last summer and says it's the most embarrassing moment of her life. The crew, uh, the the crow flew straight into her head and got tangled in her hair. A lovely man who was working nearby came to her aid. She's since terrified of crows. Have you been attacked by a crow or by a bird or animal before? Mm-hmm. This is top news now reporting from, from Cork, guys. And Brendan came along and said, my grandmother has the complete opposite problem. She keeps attacking crows. They fly in and land on her sky digital dish, which she sits on the wall just outside her bedroom window on the second floor of her bungalow in Curraheen. Last Oxford. And it goes on. <laughs> if anything, it's just a pure jumble and jargon of words. But... Uh, it, it 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 does come together, and e to one is like it's like a mini story. It's it's, it's the it's, it's the specifics that catch people out. So when you say when you throw people, even they're reading it out loud. It's when, it's reading it out loud is just completely different. Like, but when you when you if you say like if you just wanted to shorten that story, it was my grandmother. It has a diff has the opposite problem. She's attacking crows with a BB gun. People wouldn't really believe it. But when you start saying my grandmother who lives in Curraheen and throw little specific details in there people will believe it yeah <laughs> it's fake no, news I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's actually something i might have used when i was like lying to my parents when i was younger yeah. lying to my uh, teachers i'd all, i'd come up with just some random detail it, it was actually it was three o'clock when i did it yeah right. and um yeah i i remember jesus it was right outside um patty horgan's shop and sure maria sullivan walked past when i did it so yeah. definitely happened you know, yeah, just make sure um, Maria Sullivan cooperates. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, Brendan, look, I've kept you for, I think, generally longer than any other guest, um, which I <laughs> apologetic for in one way. Ah, but also, a yeah, do you know, it, 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 it's actually nice to, to hear your story because um, I was, you know, confused by having a look at so many different articles and now getting the full thing from you. Um, you know, here in, in one episode, one medium, it is nice. So, Hi, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having um, me. Cheers, Brendan. Good luck. Bye.